Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinemity.com slash podcast. Get CME by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome back on the show, Sarah Merwin. She is an epidemiologist, and she's the co-author of the book, The Informed Patient, A Complete Guide to a Hospital Stay. We're going to talk about her Kevin MD article, The Isolation of the COVID ICU, The Need for Patient Advocates. Sarah, welcome back to the show. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here again, Kevin, with you. I always enjoy our conversations and I'll try to do my background and sure. story a little differently than before because there's always different ways to look at it. Perfect. And I think we last talked back in December of 2020, so that was some time ago. Now, just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. So I'm trained as a chronic disease epidemiologist and as it turned out, I worked in clinical departments, mostly in hospitals. So as I took on different projects and worked with different specialties, I really became immersed and part of the fabric of the hospital working side by side with clinicians and other healthcare workers. So I ended up writing a book called The, the Informed Patient, A Complete Guide to a Hospital Stay with a hospitalist co-author, Dr. Karen Friedman. And it, at the same time, as I was learning about patient care and, and clinical medicine, I had family members who required my help getting through their medical journeys. So everything sort of coalesced and I got, although I always continued to work in clinical research and teach methods, I got pulled into patient navigation mm. kind of, I would have to say by accident and, but it's been a very rewarding experience. All right. So you talk about the need for patient navigation and patient advocacy, especially during the COVID crisis. There were so many stories and episodes that needed that. One of your articles, the isolation of the COVID ICU, the need for patient advocates, you talk about one such instance. And now tell me, how did this article come together? Well, I had this article brewing for a very long time. It was, it was very cathartic to write it. It's actually part of a series of narrative pieces that I wrote to discuss helping patients and their families get through inpatient episodes prior to COVID. And then when COVID hit, it, it turned out not only, not only was I following that science very carefully, but I was working on a, a very comprehensive critical care project with Lachman Swami, who created a game, a tabletop game based on the ICU environment. So I was very, very immersed in the, in, in the critical care science, translating the terms and concepts for a lay audience. And, and then there, of course, COVID was, was brewing. And this was during the first year, people started reaching out to me. So I was very well positioned between following the science very well, very thoroughly and, and having the day-to-day -day -day experience of refreshing my memory on critical care medicine. And all the, although the, the game itself and, and all the, the concepts and the terms that we talk about is, is not at all about COVID. It turns out that many of manifestations of COVID are just the bread and butter of, of critical care respiratory failure, multi-organ failure, sepsis, and most importantly, the need for ventilation. So it all coalesced and I, I was approached by, by people for their help because they were so overwhelmed with the, the, the frightening experience of having a loved one in the ICU without access because during the first year, no one was, visitors were not allowed. And what could I do? I had the tools to help and I, I jumped in. Give us an example of some of those requests. What kind of questions did these families ask you? The kinds of questions, they, they had no idea how to get in touch with the ICU. So the, 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 the family that my article is about, I got the call that they needed help and they were just at a loss. And the only contact they were getting from the ICU during their loved one's 
COVID episode was a request for authorization for, for procedures. So the, the first thing we had to do was establish communication. They were, they, they did not realize that they could be part of that process. So we initiated phone calls with the ICU so that we could get information about how their loved one's doing. They absolutely had no idea. I mean, this was totally chaotic. Staff was just pulled in a million different directions and many were out sick. So we tried to make contact as often as possible with the bedside nurse and also the nurse practitioners and the intensivists on the floor to find out what, what this patient's story was. And so that was the first thing, opening the, the, the channel for communication. And I guess the second, st and second step mm -hmm. for us was in the background, researching the credentials of the, the, of the care team so, such that we felt confident that she was in good hands and that we would not require her to be transferred. At the same time, we started gathering information about the patient. And this was central to the process, we, the, the, the tracking process. We collected this patient's data. We just, we scribed, we asked questions. We wanted to know her medication, her ventilatory settings, what, what complications were po potential and what, you know, what e a, an, a status check on all her organ function and what tests were going to be conducted. So that was the first step. When, the pa when I was first put in contact with the family, the patient was quite sick and we did not at that point initiate video conferences, mm -hmm. but that, that ultimately became part of the process. So as I led with questions and the family members scribed or asked their questions, they became more involved in, in their loved one's journey. And they gained a sense of control if they could ask what the, the ventilatory settings were and what, what her, her sedative dose was on a, on a particular day. So it was very informational, which was empowering to the family because they, they gained a sense of control to be part of this narrative. How difficult was it for you to get this information and establish a dialogue with the ICU staff? Well, the ICU staff was at this point so busy and so overwhelmed with sick patients that it was often hard to get their attention. And we walked a fine line between being good advocates for this patient and for also for the comfort of the family so that they had this contact but also being annoying. We would call, we would often, we'd be put on hold for 20 minutes and then we would figure out we'd have to call back. We never called during shift change because we know during handoff and nursing report that there's not a chance to speak to a clinician. And ultimately we, the, we connected with social workers and, and the, you know, the, the back office at the hospital to help us with, with these communications. So I think the staff was theoretically very happy to talk to us and have our involvement and see how much we cared. I always believe that that, that involvement from the family sends a very strong subliminal message or outright message to the care team that this patient is loved and cared for. But they were very busy and there were nonstop emergencies at this time. So if we called and they were all running to a code, it's, you know, we understood that, that we were not the priority in that moment. What are some things that families can do now? So certainly we're three plus years into COVID. Hopefully things aren't as busy as they once were. What are some tips that you could share with families to advocate for patients in a critical care setting? Whenever possible, it's so important to be on site. And if that means sleeping in a chair next to the loved one in the ICU or in, in the, the family lounge outside the ICU, if, if they're not permitted, just to be on site. Um, mm. Families are, are very attuned 
to subtle changes in the in their loved ones that often the monitors don't pick up and the clinical staff might not pick up. I think delirium is a great example of this when families can play a central role, being vigilant for onset of delirium, which we know in the ICU is associated with very serious post-acute syndromes that, that, that can persist. So reorienting the patient, making sure that they have all their assistive devices. In the ICU, it's a little bit different because many patients are sedated and, and that's a place where it's important for patients to intervene and make sure that patients have sedation vacations and not remain unconscious for too long and too deeply sedated. So that they're allowed to come out of these, these paralytic and, and sedative episodes so they can interact with the world. And the A2F bundle, which was created by the, I think it's the Society for Critical Care Medicine, addresses all the, the preventive strategies for offsetting delirium in the ICU. Now, I asked you for advice, certainly from family members, but let me reframe it and say, what kind of tips can you give to the clinical staff in terms of engaging families? Because it's been established how important that is, but what are some ways that the clinical staff can engage with families in a critical care setting? They, they can, we always encourage clinical staff to listen to the patient. And mm -hmm. in this case, it's very important to listen to the, to the family members. They, they know their, their, their loved one best and clinical staff can engage with the family to find out as much as they can with the family and patient to find out what kind of music they like, mm -hmm. to find out what's important to them and to encourage family participation to the extent that it's possible. Families in the ICU can help patients get out of bed. Mm -hmm. They can help feed when patients are, are taking PO and they can be involved in many ways of giving comfort and patient and families should whenever possible attend bedside rounds and be included as participants in in that in that process now what can families do in cases where they don't feel like they're being heard what are their options at that point if they don't feel they're being heard i guess the first place to take that would be to the the nurse manager who oversees the the bedside nurses or to engage with social work to express frustration about this some hospitals have ombudsmen to help patients navigate these difficult situations. And if they're truly not getting the response that they, they want, they, they have to start writing letters or making some noise. And we generally believe that you can catch more bees with, with, with honey. And that's the approach that I would take. As an example, when we couldn't reach staff, we didn't get angry, but we got proactive. We, mm -hmm. we, we went around and we were willing to be ultra flexible about when we could interact remotely with the clinical staff. So I would say one hiccup we enc encountered was, was that bedside staff was so busy that once we started having video chats with the patient during the patient's spontaneous breathing trials, where she was slowly weaned off the ventilator. Sometimes the nurse would leave the room and leave the patient on, on the feed with the daughter. And it was terrifying, absolutely terrifying for this grown adult child to watch her mother gasping for breath because uh, sedation vac vacations with um, with spontaneous breathing trials can be a, a very torturous experience. And so we actually went back to the social worker and the and and patient services and said, we'll, we'll do the video chats whenever you want, but you cannot leave the feed on 
and not be bedside. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of some proactivity that was helpful to us. We're talking to Sarah Merwin. She is an epidemiologist. She's the co-author of the book, The Informed Patient, A Complete Guide to a Hospital Stay. We're talking about her Kevin in the article, The Isolation of the COVID ICU, The Need for Patient Advocates. Sarah, my final question, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. I guess I'm going to combine the take-home messages with your question about what am I passionate about now? Mm -hmm. Because that is where what I'm thinking about all the time. I'm passionate about disarming misinformation and disinformation. And I'm concerned about long COVID. And I guess my take-home message is we should all be paying a whole lot of attention to the havoc that the sufferers, the cohort of sufferers of long COVID are going to play on our already very fragmented and damaged healthcare system. I guess that's my parting shot. And we need to prepare for the next pandemic with infrastructure and, and resources, because many of the experts in infectious diseases believe that we will see another pandemic and not in a hundred years. Sarah, thank you so much for coming back on the show and thanks for your time and insight. Thank you for listening.